Good morning, dear people. Today I'm going to talk to you about Sunderland, which is both a geographical description and a source of dreams and mythology, which are now inspiring particularly Asians, because it looks as if it might have been one of the cradles of Homo sapiens, of our brothers and sisters, of our same tribe, of the only surviving race of human beings. From a geological point of view, Sunderland is a subcontinent of East Asia, rather as India is a subcontinent of West Asia. The difference between them is, of course, Sunderland has been flooded and dried out at least 12 times during the last ice age. Now, we've had about five ice ages. So you might legitimately ask, why is the present one that we're in now called the Quaternary? For reasons which are absolutely ridiculous and is worth Googling. And it started about 2.6 million years ago. And in that time, the sea level has risen and descended at least 12 times. So the land of Sunderland, which falls beneath Thailand and Malaysia and Singapore, and that mainland Asian part used to be at the dry periods 12 times dried out sufficiently to be able to walk from mainland Asia all the way down to East Kalimantan, Eastern Borneo, or all the way down to Bali, but no further, because there began the great deep tectonic divide between the plates of the Suhul land of Australia and Sunda land of Asia. Now, that brings us a bit to what are these ice ages. Of course, the reason that the sea has dried out during the colder periods of the ice ages is because the water of the planet is drawn up and frozen in the poles. And it makes it possible to walk from mainland Asia all the way across what was an extraordinarily large and fertile and extremely beautiful part of the world where Paleoanthropologists are now arguing numerous forms of hominids, pre-humans, and humans have developed. Now, it's popular to say, and has been the orthodox thing to say, that all of us came out of Africa. Our original ancestors probably did, because if we look at the DNA of all the world's people, about 97% of it is from the origins of Africa. Though it seems as if we left Africa still as pre-humans and gradually developed through different varieties of human beings to what we are today. Now, just at the beginning of this millennium, only 23 years ago, it was thought there have been about 10 varieties of human beings, of Homo, and some 20 varieties of pre-humans. But an enormous explosion has taken place in the discoveries beneath the soil and in caves just in the last 23 years. Numerous peoples have been discovered in these our islands in this part of the world. One of them, of course, is uh, Denisovians, who were believed to have descended from Homo erectus. A great excitement took place, of course, in 1890 when Dubois discovered the skull of what was called Java Man, now referred to as Homo erectus. So uh, early forms of humanity are believed to have left Africa, uh, pre-human forms, and uh, particularly they reached the Middle East, and then that first, say, that's a, it's a complicated field, but to try and make it as simple as possible, there in the Middle East, the species that left Africa, Heidelbergensis his name is, split into two forms. One went northwest and became Neanderthal man of Europe, and the other turned eastwards, went through India all the way to China, the Denisovians. And we only discovered the first Denisovian skull in 2005. And it has since been discovered in various other places. The first place it was discovered in Tibet, uh, in Siberia to be more precise, where it had been frozen for thousands of years, just long enough for us to be able to take some of the DNA. It now turns out that many of the people of Asia have Denisovian blood in them. So did they evolve around here? We don't know. But we do know that between 
Homo erectus and Homo sapiens, there were numerous natural experiments that took place in how to make human beings, both amongst pre-humans and humans. But amongst the human tribes, the human varieties that have been discovered, only this century, for instance, there's Homo floresiensis, who was discovered in 2003 in Flores, also referred to as the, the Hobbit, believed to have lived as recently as 14 to 20,000 years ago, which is incredibly recent. And then we have uh, Ualian people who were discovered in southern Sulawesi, recently discovered skeleton of a young lady there, different form of human being, but still homo, still in our tribe. And then we've had Lusonensis, who was found in the Philippines very late, Quite interesting because Homo floresiensis, remember, was adults were three feet tall. Lusonensis, they were smaller still. The adults were smaller still. So a lot of argument took place. Were these even really a variety of human being or were they a pre-human, pre-Homo? Well, definitely it is now believed they were human beings because we've subsequently found their tools. We found that they hunted collaboratively. They were making fire and they were uh, actually living off a pygmy form of elephant that was found in Flores at the time, and giant rats. And the world's largest rat is still found in Flores, the Flores rat. It's at least that big its body, and with its tail, it's about that long. So these were human beings, but they weren't our species. They weren't Homo sapiens, but in about 50 for say 60,000 years ago, Homo sapiens was making his way across this Sunda plate, Sunda land, down towards Australia. He would have encountered both Homo lusonensis and Homo floresiensis. In fact, it's believed that those two little tiny peoples died out because they were eaten by us, Homo sapiens. Now, the interesting thing is there's a connection between Sunderland and the old stories of great catastrophic floods. The most famous of which is by Plato, who lived about 400 years before Christ, what, 700 years before Allah. And he described having talked to Egyptian wise men who described what in their early writings talked of a great flood. They give it a date some 9,500 years ago. And they reckoned it took place in the Atlantic, beyond the Pillars of Hercules, which is where Malta and Gibraltar are today. But it is a myth that is found throughout the world and is inherited today from numerous very ancient civilizations. The Olmecs in the Latin Americas, the Mayas, they have stories of tremendous and sudden floods. Uh, of course, the Greeks got it from these original Egyptians and it was catastrophic and sudden. Even the Batak people have an origin myth of how the world had become dusty and dirty and the gods decided to sweep it clean with a great tidal wave. But he allowed the escape of one couple who made it to very high ground, watched the whole phenomena of the world getting wiped out by water and managed to produce children who then became the Batak people. So this is a myth that is not confined to one part of the world, which isn't surprising because during these ice ages, the world's water level rose and descended. 120,000 years ago, it was some 216 meters deep. And then just as recently as 11,000 years ago, it was 70 meters deep, which is about the same level as the Java Sea is today. But before that, while it was drier still, it was apparently the ultimate paradise for human beings, especially developing human beings. They, as we are today, were surrounded by rich volcanic activity, which fertilized their crops and made life easy. And as the waters rose, people's 
became more isolated on the islands, which were the peaks of the actual volcanoes, the peaks of the hills there. And that's why they became so individualistic and distinctive, and why we have such a variety of Indonesian peoples, languages, their actual looks. This would have been due to the isolation that existed then. It would also explain something of Indonesia's expertise with the sea, for this is a seafaring nation. And so it should be if the sea had risen and fallen so many times. Now, what evidence is there for this? Well, there is genetic evidence, but not much of it, because not much of it survives in the tropics. But what is interesting is perhaps lasting longer than any written records, and certainly longer than any physical material bones or substances for our bodies, is our genetic memory is what we remember, what is passed on in the shape of our genes, stories that resonate with us about great floods. You might think, how if the water rose and descended very gradually, do we hear of catastrophic sudden events? Easy to explain. Whenever it rises, there are such catastrophic events because there are invariably valleys lower which are protected by mountain range or by higher land. And then when this water reaches around it, it will breach like a dam, and you will have vast amounts of water pouring very suddenly to these great valleys. Indonesia has a very long and old legacy of megalithic remains, some of them still functioning. Sumba, Nias, early megalithic structures are found also in Borneo and of course Java, even Bali, and even in Bia in West Papua. And uh, perhaps the most interesting of all uh, that has to be mentioned in the context of Sunderland has got to be the discovery of this massive structure in West Java called Gunung Padan. It was first described by a Dutchman in 1890, and then another Dutchman came along in 1914, just before the World War, that of course stopped all archaeological research. And then Indonesian local farmers made a big fuss about it in 1979. And the Indonesian archaeological institutes came and did their first research there. Now this is an extraordinary thing, it's about 800 feet above sea level. It is built on the top of a little volcano, and it has five terraces. It covers 79 uh, acres of territory. What's that? 29, 30 hectares. And it's on these five terraces. And these terraces are strewn with pillars that have fallen over, which are of natural volcanic anthracite which is hexagonal. It looks as if it's been carved by a human being, but there are many examples of it around the world where lava dries under certain circumstances and it produces perfectly hexagonally shaped columns. It's like a beehive. You compress a circle equally with other circles and it becomes a hexagon. Well, these things are very heavy and they're very hard. And there are thousands of them. And they've been lifted up from elsewhere to the top of this mountain. They have been subjecting this mountain to various tomographic research, to drilling for samples, and they have established after the first five meters. The first five meters represent about uh, 7,000 years ago, and the next 15 meters about eight, 12,000 years ago, and so on. They have drilled down to 30 meters, 100 feet depth, where they find the earliest foundations of this great pyramid-like shape, which may go back to 23,000 years old. Now, this is a definitive proof. If it bears scrutiny, if it holds water with further research, that there were far earlier civilizations than what is presently understood to have been the start of civilizations just 10,000 years ago in Mesopotamia. And the odds are that these large civilizations started in this part of the world and quite possibly in Indonesia. But to finish my little talk here, confusing as it is, let me tell you, yes, it is confusing. The origin of man, paleoanthropology, looking for early traces of mankind and trying to come up with a pattern of where he evolved and where he moved to is difficult. For a start, 
Everything we know or believe about man's origins stem from physical evidence that could fit in the back of a pickup truck. And that's why I say what tells us our truth may be our inner selves, feeling what our genetic memory has to say. But I urge you all to research closely the fascinating data on this Gunung Padang, because it would put every other ancient archaeological site in the shade. It would throw our human origins back by at least 20,000 years. Here is the first of many numerous fascinating discoveries being made here in Indonesia about who we all are and where we all came from. <laughs>